Welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Path to a More Equitable Future, How Tech and Data Can Give Americans Longer, Healthier Lives. On behalf of Becker's Healthcare, welcome and thank you for joining us. Before we begin, I'm going to walk through a few quick housekeeping instructions. If you have any questions throughout today's webinar, you can type those into the Q&A box you see on your screen. You will find a few engagement tools on your dashboard. Please check out our resources section and also make sure you fill out our session survey. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log in to today's webinar to access the recording. Lastly, if at any time you have trouble with the audio or video, please try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box, and we are here to help. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to our presenters to begin today's presentation. Welcome everyone. My name is Dina Kraft and I have the pleasure of leading partnerships and alliances at Salesforce. And we are delighted to host an engaging conversation today with four leading healthcare experts talking about how technology can help us improve health span and overall health outcomes. So joining me today is Dr. Jay Bott from Deloitte. And Jay's gonna start by just sharing some of the latest research that his firm um, has recently released. And then Jay will moderate a conversation with Dr. Driver from Advocate Health, Dr. Dua from Mass Massachusetts General, and Dr. Jackson from Common Spirit. I'd like to thank each of you in advance for taking your time out of your day to have this engaging conversation. And without further ado, Jay, I'll turn it over to you. We're anxious to hear some of the latest research out of Deloitte. Thank you, Dina. Thrilled to be here with you and our esteemed panelists for the exciting conversation. Did you know that Americans are spending only 85% of their living years with good health? According to a recent analysis that we did, all Americans could potentially live up to 95% of their lives in good health and live to be nearly 90 years old. That's nearly 20 years of health span, better quality of life, better health, longer life. And we believe employers are uniquely positioned to help achieve this vision through collaborating with the healthcare system, digital health, engaging with their employees and workforce initiatives. People of color, American Indians and Alaskan natives have even more health span to gain. The research that we've done suggests that there's a premium on getting closer to patients and providing them with more personal service and meeting them where they're at. When it comes to drivers of health that impact 80% of health outcomes, understanding social needs and connecting them to those services is important. For example, the tools like the Salesforce Data Cloud can be an engine to perform some of the segmentation, identification, and personalized engagement. Cloud, along with AI technologies, can be incredible enablers towards advancing an equitable future of health. And when it comes to health inequities, they account for $320 billion in annual health care spending, according to an analysis we completed, signaling an understandable crisis for the industry. If unaddressed, health inequities costs could reach $1 trillion by 2040. And in, in addition, given the current conversation around technology and generative AI, we also know that consumer and executive interest in generative AI is strong, but there are blind spots to be mindful of. These include effective governance being lost among other data priorities, healthcare leaders not paying enough attention to what matters most to consumers, investing in and responding to workforce needs, including upskilling and redesigning teams and work remains a low priority, but it's so important. 80% of health equity leaders said they have low or no involvement in decisions about AI strategy. We're thrilled about this conversation that built on some of this data, and we'll start with introductions of our panelists and reactions uh, to what I just shared. It's so great to have Dr. Jackson, Dr. Driver, and Dr. Dua with us today. Thanks so much for being here. Let's get to our panelists. I'd love to start with uh, Dr. Driver. Well, Dr. Driver, tell us about your point of view and, and from where you sit, any reactions, kind of the data I shared and where we are in the industry. Uh, my name is Steve Driver. I'm an interventional and structural cardiologist with Advocate Health. And that means I meet many of my patients for the first time when they're really sick, having a heart attack. And as you can imagine, they're particularly interested in modifying things like their diet, their smoking status, their physical activity. So I've always been interested in helping patients when they're really sick but also um, helping them to live a long and healthy life. And for that reason, the other hat that I wear is as medical director for digital health strategy for Advocate Health. 
And that involves pulling together three types of services, virtual visits to help patients have more convenient access for their care, um, remote physiologic monitoring and remote therapeutic monitoring. So we can help um, stay in touch with patients between their visits, monitoring vital signs and adherence to medications. Uh, and then also digital therapeutics like medical nutrition therapy. So we can put tools in their hands that help them help themselves. Thank you so much, Dr. Driver. Now, uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Dua to introduce herself and share any reactions and perspective you have. Thank you. So my name is Anaita Dua. I'm a vascular surgeon at the Mass General Hospital and associate professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School. And um, my real niche area is in peripheral artery disease, which is essentially what Dr. Driver does in the heart, I do in the legs. Unfortunately, um, in this country, with the explosion of diabetes, we're seeing a lot more patients that are moving towards amputation and ultimately being amputated. And about 50% of the patients that are older than 60 are dead within two years of that amputation. And that's not because amputation of the leg actually goes on to kill somebody, but the fact that they're so unhealthy that they got to that spot, it's an indicator that this person is not going to make it very long. And honestly, you know, based on what you said also, Dr. Butt, seriously, a lot of these, these problems that lead them down this path in the first place can be alleviated by digital health solutions. Um, this particular patient set, as Dr. Driver said, is very motivated to change their ways, especially after they come to me also in the throes of something horrible, like needing an amputation, and now the desire to protect the other leg. But the problem is that given their physical ailment, they're unable to make it, for example, to the hospital for multiple wound checks. They're, and, and this might be two, three, four times a week, just unable to do it. They're unable to come in to um, be checked with the endocrinologist because they're unable to um, you know, get parking, even something as simple as that, that can prevent them from getting the holistic care. And then they sort of give up on everything. But digital solutions to delivering that care actually would alleviate a significant amount of the burden and would be able to change their trajectory completely. And that's just in the area of preventative care. Now, when you move over to something like, let's say I have a patient that's lucky and was able to get a bypass graft. How do I know that that graft is not about to shut down and the leg about to be amputated. I don't. The patient has to come all the way to hospital, get an ultrasound, get checked, and then I have to say, oh, yes or no, the graft needs intervention. Imagine a digital solution, which does exist, but just is not in the hands of the patient yet, where it can actually sense that the flow in the graft is decreasing and this patient has something threatened that I can then intervene on and save before it actually shuts down. And these are the types of digital solutions that have a way of revolutionizing the way in which we treat patients. And in my state of being, certainly saves a number of legs and then lives. So I'm really excited to have this conversation with you today. Thank you, Dr. Dua. Appreciate uh, that perspective. And with that, say there are ways that we can intervene using digital, uh, building relationships. Uh, but there's also uh, you know, this thing about being human, the science of hope and kindness. And so I'd like to come to uh, Dr. Jackson about your perspective on your role and the work you're doing uh, and how we can advance health and health equity. No, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bott. Um, so excited to be with all of you today with Dr. Driver and Dr. Dua, such an esteemed uh, uh, group. Um, so, um, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, like Dr. Bott, I am a primary care provider. Uh, I'm a family medicine physician, and I specifically chose family medicine um, really because of the biopsychosocial model of care. I was drawn to um, thinking about prevention. I was drawn to thinking about well-being. Um, and uh, quite frankly, I was drawn to a specialty that uh, really was focused on being in in the community, in and of the, the community. Um, and so I um, have spent my entire uh, career working with vulnerable populations um, and really thinking about how do we care for those who are quite frankly, systematically excluded uh, in, the, in this country. And, you know, as, as I was growing up, uh, you know, my grandmother was, my grandmother's house was the house where everyone came to, right? She was the matriarch of our family and quite frankly, of the, the neighborhood on the west side of Dayton, Ohio. And so I really um, grew up with this mindset of giving back and always extending grace and always being, um, being available for, for what people need. Um, and I think that really led me to be in this position that I, I am in right now. And so I am the inaugural president of the Lloyd Dean Institute for Human Kindness and Health Justice um, at Common Spirit Health. 
Uh, for those of you who may not know, Common Spirit is uh, the family organization or the parent organization of Dignity Health, Catholic Health Initiatives, Virginia Mason, and Centura. And so um, with that, we're one of the largest nonprofit healthcare systems in the country. Uh, we're in over 24 states. Uh, and we are one of the largest provider of Medicaid services. And so we have this very strong commitment embedded in our mission and our vision and our values to really take care of vulnerable populations um, and to do that in a way that is centered around human kindness. Um, and so my role in, the, in this new institute is really to leverage the science of kindness, compassion, empathy, and trust to accelerate improvements in health equity and social justice. And the reality is there's decades and decades and decades of science um, in this space. There's decades of science um, around hope. Um, and we also know how these things are directly connected and correlated with health outcomes and with life expectancy, right? And so how are we making sure as healthcare providers, as a healthcare delivery system, we're including that social science piece into the care that, that we deliver? And so uh, really excited to be a part of the conversation today um, and to share uh, some of that science and information and data with you all. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. And I think what uh, I heard was just fascinating and diverse, uh, but related experiences. And, you know, our research and the comments that you've all suggested that suggested that there is a premium on building and sustaining trust, getting closer to patients and consumers and providing them with more personal service, but also meeting them where they are. And data and technology to give that picture is so important. I see it in the eyes of my patients when they expect data to be available about their CT scan or the perspective of their consultant, uh, but it's not there. And so uh, having a 360 view um, that's uh, dynamic is critically important to get to the kind of outcomes that the three of you shared. And so let's get real practical in terms of examples that you're seeing to impact health span, especially when it comes to cardiovascular health and chronic disease like diabetes, uh, because those I think can be bellwethers for you know how we think about our approach and system differently. And so let me start with uh, uh, Dr. Driver and, and Dr. Dua. Sure, when when I uh, think about those patients who meet me in the cath lab having a heart attack, if we were to look back five, 10, 15, sometimes 20 years, uh, the risk factors that lead to those are uncontrolled high blood pressure, uncontrolled cholesterol, um, a diet that's not as rich in healthy fruits and vegetables as, as we would always want, and uh, stress, um, depressive symptoms that does not allow patients to help themselves and manage their own care. And so we were finding that many of the patients in our primary care clinics were return patients, which was crowding out the ability for our PCPs to see more new patients and also some of the sicker patients who need to be seen more urgently. And we've launched something called the Virtual Chronic Condition Management Program. Many of the visits that patients were having in person were for things that really should be considered digitally sensitive, hypertension, um, high, high blood cholesterol, diabetes, anxiety, depression. And so what we've done is worked with patients, primary care physicians who have that ongoing relationship with them to leverage things like our uh, patient registries and patient lists to identify patients who either have a diagnosis of those conditions in our electronic health record. And remember, we're in six states now across um, uh, five and a half million patients. So there are many patients as the third largest not-for-profit healthcare system in the nation who have these conditions. And reaching out to them proactively, we have found is a better solution than adding another task to a busy PCP's practice, asking them to refer into a program like this. So we can actually build out registries of these patients, send them a message through their LiveWell portal, and invite them to participate in this program with a trusted nurse practitioner who is partnered back with their PCP to help digitally manage these conditions. And when they get there, there's really three components of the program. One, a trusted um, virtual nurse practitioner or physician's assistant who is partnered with their usual PCP, who is managing conditions like high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, anxiety, and depression um, by um, um, algorithms that help to, to uh, um, guide that patient's care. We know that only about 50% of patients with hypertension, for example, have their blood pressure controlled. Now, there are a variety of guidelines dating back 20 years to JNC7 that specify different targets for blood pressure. 
um, different diagnostic thresholds for hypertension. So standardizing and optimizing that care was something we heard loud and clear from our PCPs that if we were going to manage these conditions virtually with clinicians that are different than their usual PCPs, they wanted to know that that care was standardized and optimized. And then finally, you know, standardizing and optimizing the care that they receive at the visits is one thing, but as we know, most of, most of a patient's life is not spent in the doctor's office. It's spent between those visits. So we use remote physiologic monitoring. Finally, we've talked a lot about medicines and optimizing those, but many patients actually would be interested in, in optimizing their health through you know, non-pharmacologic practices. So one thing that we're really excited to be rolling out now is medical nutrition therapy. From a health equity standpoint, we know that 44% of our patients on the South side do not have access to personal transportation. And if they do, there's not always a healthy grocery store that they can drive to. Our ability to refer them to a virtual registered dietitian that they can have a specific diet prescribed to them for have healthy groceries delivered to their doorstep, use their SNAP benefits, and then follow videos on how to prepare those, helps patients help themselves. So we're excited about the combination of those three things, virtual visits, remote monitoring between visits, and then digital therapeutics like medical nutrition therapy. I think that what you are suggesting is this enterprise approach, a bundle. I like to think of it as a digital health span bundle. Um, where you think about the interconnectedness of these elements to create the successful outcomes. Now, you know, Dr. Dua, you've talked about some of these issues uh, in a perspective of the New York Times about how people end up. I mean, preventable amputations is a significant issue in our country. You know, how do we think about care more upstream and the relationship between the various parts of the system and using digital technology tools uh, to also support that? Thank you very much. That's a that's a great question, and I'm, I appreciate you bringing up that article because, you know, it really ties all of us in. Um, what uh, Dr. Jackson talks about, Dr. Driver's talking about, this idea of trying to deliver equitable health, and really, technology is the way that this ultimately can be done. In that particular New York Times article, indeed, I was talking about preventable amputation, which is skyrocketing now in this country and doesn't look like it's coming down at all. By 2045, we're going to have such a significant proportion of our patients with diabetes, with end-stage diabetes, who are living, which means that we're seeing complications that we previously did not see. And with that has come a barrage of other diseases that we right now don't have a great way of managing. And part of that reason is because we're unable to pick it up early. Um, I will say that, you know, we have to be careful though and focus on kind of what you said earlier about the human element. A lot of these patients want that human contact. They need to have their questions answered back and forth and we need to meet them where they are exactly like what you said. And we have all, I mean, we're about to put someone on Mars in the next, you know, 30 years. So we have all the technology in the world to create the fanciest EMRs, the fanciest robotics that can talk to patients and digital, but if the patients will not sign on and be a part of that, or if the patients don't have the tools, I mean, for example, if a patient needs a smartwatch or a smartphone or needs to be able to log onto a computer, needs, you know, constant internet, these are the types of things that we need to be thinking about as we create these digital tools so that we do not increase the um, health disparities by trying actually to decrease them. And so if we're going to have this conversation, I think we need to start out by saying, you know, this this ex patient on the south side of Chicago or in the depths of Boston over here where I work, what are the barriers currently to what is out there? Now, I'll tell you personally, personally, when I try to use digital tools, I actually find the something as simple as remembering the password and logging on and off difficult. I sometimes find the actual screen where I need to find my results difficult to, to maneuver. And I can't imagine one of my patients going through that. So my New York Times article was all about getting to the patients, meeting them where they are, and actually saying, these are the things that will work for you, and then getting the government to kind of intervene and deliver those tools to these patients. And I'm using these broad terms because I don't know what the actual answer is. But I do know that we, as a, as a community, if we're going to go down this route, which we really should, because it has the extreme potential to make um, healthcare disparity decrease, it has the potential to save legs and lives, as I mentioned earlier, but we don't want to cause more trouble with technology by, by not talking to patients up front as we build these tools and ensuring that whatever we do doesn't actually cause more disparity and more harm than good. Can I add on to that? I mean, Hita or Dr. Yu, I think that's a really important part, um, the the human component that goes along with the tech. We can't forget about that. And your, your story about forgetting passwords reminds me of one of my own patients. Um, I had a patient 
come through. He had had a heart attack. Um, we had put a stent in and he was on the floor recovering. And I, I actually went up personally to enroll him into a digital health initiative. It was a two pay, two way patient communication and education tool that helps remind patients to take their medications after they leave the hospital, allows them to stay in touch with their care team. And he actually had a Bluetooth headset in and he was playing a game on his smartphone. And I thought, this is going to be a home run. This is going to be an easy patient to enroll. And it wasn't easy. Maybe he was uh, trembling a little bit because he had just had a heart attack and his his, uh, interventional cardiologist is hovering over his shoulder. But he had to try to remember his app store password. He had to, you know, delete some apps on his phone to make make way for the Yahoo mail client, reset his Yahoo password. And he had to try it several times. But once we gave him that at the elbow support, we do have some research to suggest that this is the case, that that tech anxiety went way down. And um, just 30 minutes or so of at the elbow support can really help patients get comfortable with these tools. And then they can fly with them, then they can use them. But I think it's really important that they get set up correctly. We do the same with really any of our virtual visits. The patients have an opportunity to um, download Zoom, get our apps installed, get comfortable with the technology before they're seen. And we try to deploy extra resources to make sure that they they can actually use these digital health tools. Um, and I think by doing it in that way, um, we don't leave behind populations that maybe need a little bit more help to get started, but could ultimately really benefit from these tools. Thank you so much uh, for that perspective. Uh, Dr. Jackson, you know, one of the things you talk about is how people are screened, where they're screened, and also this issue of screening, referring, and navigation. Uh, but how do you put this all the, together with you know the the perspective you have and the work you've done in, uh, across the the delivery system and with community based organizations? Yes, well, uh, thank you for for the question, and and again, um, kudos to everything that Dr. Driver and Dr. Dua just said. Um, I think we're in an interesting inflection time. Um, in healthcare delivery uh, right now. Um, And I think technology and data is one of those transformational drivers, right, of of this interesting time. But I think one of the other um, things that is is significantly driving how healthcare is going to be delivered is now the focus on the social drivers or social determinants on health. Um, Many of us have been involved in that space our entire career. Um, We've already heard both Dr. Driver and Dr. Dua specifically give patient examples um, of things that they're seeing, whether it's a lack of transportation or a lack of access to um, healthy foods. Um, But now we're actually being required, right, to do so um, this year with CMS um, guidelines changing. Uh, Most of our acute care facilities are now going to be screening for social drivers um, of health with patients who are admitted to our hospitals. Um, And that's going to be another large data set that, quite frankly, we haven't seen. You know, so even for those of us who have been doing it here and, you know, here and there as a large um, healthcare industry, I would say it's going to be a massive influx of data around these social drivers. And, uh, you know, kudos to our public health colleagues who have been, you know, saying for decades, hey, we we need to really be looking at some of these upstream factors. And now, again, they're going to have this significant amount of data to, quite frankly, validate um, everything that they've they've been saying. Um, So, again, data is a tool, right? And technology is a tool um, that we can leverage. But at the end of the day, we actually have to be actionable with the data and with the tools. And we also have to be mindful that as we are now collecting this information, that is someone's lived experience. And so for us, we've really been thoughtful around, well, how are we even educating our patients and our communities on this process? How are we connecting with our community-based organizations? Um, you know, you start screening and all of a sudden you find that 20% of your patient population is food insecure. Well, yes, we can leverage tools. We can leverage technology platforms like Find Help or Unite Us to help connect patients to resources. But do our community-based organizations actually have the capacity to receive <laughs> those those referrals that we may be you know, now making. Um, And so it's really shifting how we even think about as a large health system, our community benefit strategy, our community investment strategy, our community partnership strategy, um, because 
you know, times are changing. Um, and I think all health systems are, are you know, going to be going through um, this process. I think the other thing as a part of that connecting or collecting that data from patients and educating them is how do we continue to build trust? And trust is so important. Um, we've heard it mentioned a few times throughout uh, the last couple of minutes. Um, and the reality is there are tangible things that we can do to build trust. There's a science behind building trust. In, in interpersonal interactions, things as simple as eye contact. And you go, well, that's kind of intuitive. But the reality is we're actually seeing less of that with the introduction of EMRs into the healthcare delivery system, right? So again, thinking about, yes, there are things that technology um, are bringing that are beneficial, um, but there's also some, you know, some cons, if you will, to some of the technology that has been introduced. Because as providers, we now are focused on putting all the information into the EMR that sometimes we're not having that direct eye contact. We call it at our organization, heart to heart. You know, how are we having that heart to heart listening? So teaching our providers to sit down, right? If a patient is sitting down, sit down, be heart to heart level, make eye contact, you know, with your patient. Um, and thinking about how do you build trust with your community-based organizations, being visible, right? So how are we connecting and being intentional about our relationships with community-based partnerships, being consistent um, in that um, that um, that relationship? You know, we know that there is um, cognitive bias towards the familiar, if you will, right? So how do you become familiar? Well, you have to be present. Um, and so again, just really looking at what are some of the, the um, evidence that we have on how to build trust and being consistent and implementing those tools? Again, there's just another set of tools that we can use both with our patients and with our community organizations. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Jackson. You know, one of the things that I took away was this notion of, you know, if we're going to reduce friction, if we're going to build and sustain trust, you're going to meet consumers, patients where they're at, need to have tools to drive deeper understanding of the patient and their life, their community, the the their caregivers, for example. And, we'll, and that can then help drive a more personalized outreach and personalized experience. Uh, and, and technology tools like the data cloud with Salesforce or tools like customer resource management um, and seeing the 360 picture help us do that. Uh, but the, I would say the other thing it helps us do is also address the cost equation. You know, reducing friction, building trust, st uh, addressing du duplicative actions um, can help us address the un the affordability crisis uh, as well as the access issues that we have. And um, the digital tools important, for example, the Affordable Connectivity Program is another example of how the federal government is helping uh, support technology directly with patients' communities. And I've been able to, to help provide that for others, but digital literacy is, is so important. And, uh, uh, Dr. Driver, uh, I, I think you may have a perspective here that you wanna jump into, but- Yeah, I, I wanna just me... build on something that uh, Dr. Jackson said before we move on too far, but this idea of eye contact really resonates with me. I, I found as I got into practice and moved out of training, the, the amount of time that's required to enter the data into the electronic health record during a visit really took away from the opportunity to have that heart-to-heart -heart conversation. And I love the way you put it. Um, so much so that I actually hired a scribe, another human being to come in the room to, to get away from some of the technology that was drawing me away from my patients. Now, that's not something I think we can do at scale. I, I love working with my scribe, but I don't know if that's the answer across the entire health system. But I am really interested in the use of generative AI to document those notes. It's it's about the quadruple aim. It's not just about cost, access, and quality for the patients. It's also about the physician experience as well. And if the physician is spending more time having that direct eye contact and heart-to-heart and -heart conversation, that's really important. But it also means they're not finishing their notes in the room, which means they're spending on average another two or three hours at the office or in pajama time at home when they should be with their kids um, and spending time with them. And so the ability to leverage technology, not just to improve the patient experience, but also to improve the physician experience makes a lot of sense. And that's a win-win. Instead of typing the whole time, if we can use generative AI to allow us to be human beings again and connect with patients in the room, I, I think that's going to be a, a huge win for physicians and patients alike. 
Yeah, I just double down and thank you, Dr. Driver. And, and I and I do just want to, um, I, I want us to be mindful of something that he just said, that if we can use generative AI to allow us to be humans again. I mean, if we really think about that, that's a very powerful statement and a critique, I would say, on where we are right now as providers right? <laughs> and as caregivers. And we know we have a significant um, epidemic of burnout. Right. And we have providers who are leaving the care delivery system um, for for multiple reasons. And and I, I agree with you, Dr. Driver. I do think generative AI is is another one of those things that is significantly transforming healthcare delivery. Um, we actually have a pilot going on right now where we are leveraging generative AI to be the virtual scribe, if you will. Um, and so, you know, getting back to the provider being able to have that face to face, eye contact, um, heart to heart conversation with patients. And again, it's not because it's the feel good thing to do. Um, it's what the science tells us is the thing that leads to better patient adherence with medications and with care plans and improve trust and improve both provider and patient experience. So again, there's data and research um, that that supports um, these heart to heart conversations and, and being able to have that. But um, I, I just I just wanted to comment. I think that's that was a very powerful statement that you just made that, you know, how do we leverage these tools to allow us to be human again? Um, and the other thing I would say that why this is critically important is that we are at a time in this country where we're the most digitally connected, but we're the most socially isolated. Um, I'm pretty sure that you all are aware that the U.S. Surgeon General just released a report last year that talks about the epidemic of social isolation and loneliness why is that important? Well, we know if you are experiencing social isolation and loneliness, it's equivalent to smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day from a mortality standpoint, right? So, you know, talking about peripheral artery disease, you know, talking about diabetes, all of these things, well, are we screening for social isolation? And I will tell you that was one, of, I think, one of the misses on uh, the requirements of what we're going to be screening on. Social isolation was not included. We ourselves at Common Spirit, are we are screening for social isolation in some of our markets. And I will tell you in those markets that we're screening for it, it's the number one screen positive across all age ranges. So I think that's the other thing to be mindful of. So we often think about this as a senior population issue. And that's not actually what the data is telling us. As a matter of fact, if you look at the national data, it's actually seniors and adolescents, or our youth, um, who are um, having ex who are experiencing social isolation and loneliness. So again, there's a cardiovascular um, impact. There's a depression, anxiety impact. There's a life expectancy um, impact for those who are socially isolated and lonely. Um, so again. How are we thinking about some of these things that impact health outside of, you know, what we typically think of as healthcare providers, nutrition or physical activity or, you know, um, other behavioral habits that significantly impact health? And then how are we going to really leverage technology and data um, to make improvements in, in those areas as well? Great. Well, thanks for those wonderful perspectives. And, I, you know, this issue of really helping be human first and technology augmenting that is critically important. You know, using uh, technology, but also us being human to scale kindness and hope and to drive health span. So one of the things that our newest research revealed uh, of more among generative AI is that 40% of healthcare executives may be overlooking certain things when implementing Gen AI. These are the implementation blind spots, governance, trust, talent, which is a human consideration. And I know that when pulled together, technology, humans, and a hope for better health for everyone can lead us to uh, a future of health that we all can be proud of. And so with that, I'd like to leave our audience with a last word or phrase that um, illustrates for me what you see as uh, hope for health in the future. And so we'll start with Dr. Jackson. 
No, thank you. Um, I think I'm really excited about, again, I think we're in a significant um, transformational time um, in, in healthcare. And I'm really excited that I have amazing colleagues like Dr. Dua and Dr. Driver and Dr. Bot and others who are really being intentional about this work. And I think if you're looking at, for me, what I, I, I'm thinking about is how do we continue to add to the body of knowledge around the neurophysiology of what some would say, again, are these soft things like kindness, compassion, empathy, trust, hope? Um, because the reality is it is tied to the release of certain hormones, right? And in our body, whether we're talking about oxytocin or dopamine or serotonin, um, and how do we continue to leverage technology um, to, um, to really accelerate some of this science? Um, and, and that's now being incorporated into a lot of our care delivery conversations. So that, that gives me hope. Um, I would encourage all of you to think about that in your day-to-day -day life. How are you exhibiting kindness? Um, we actually have Random Acts of Kindness Day coming up on February 17th. Um, so I encourage you all to do something nice. Um, and that can be something as simple as giving a compliment to someone or giving a hug. Again, those things release oxytocin. Um, so it makes you feel good. And it also makes the person who's receiving the act of kindness feel good. And guess what? That actually impacts our health. Um, and so um, I encourage you all to be thoughtful about that on, on February 17th. And I encourage you all, if your workplace is not having these conversations around kindness, compassion, empathy, trust, hope, be the one to bring bring it to the group, right? Um, because it's critically important as we continue to move this work forward. Dr. Driver, what do you got to say? Uh, I would say, you know, yes, for one word or phrase that we'd like to leave you with, I would I would say health. And uh, that is intentional that I'm saying health and not necessarily health care. I think when our patients are seeking our outer services, they want to um, buy, for lack of a better word, health. They're not necessarily interested in health care. In fact, only 20 percent of our health outcomes are dependent upon the health care we receive. Now, as an interventional cardiologist, there are times when a patient's in front of me with a, a blocked heart artery and, and no amount of digital health intervention is going to open that artery up. The, the health care is still extremely important, especially in certain life-threatening circumstances. But when I look to the future, I envision a future in which we not only treat patients when they're particularly ill, but work upstream to put tools in their hands that help them eat better, be more active, uh, avoid smoking, um, get a healthy night's sleep most days of the week, manage their weight, control their cholesterol, manage their blood sugar, and manage their blood pressure, what the American Heart Association would call life's essential aid. And there is good research around longevity and health span that if you can get to middle age uh, and avoid the risk factors uh, that are the inverse of those health factors, uh, you can actually complete, nearly completely eliminate your risk of developing coronary artery disease throughout your life. And can you imagine a, a lifespan that makes its way to 90 years old and a health span that accounts for 95% of that. I think that's a future that, that many of our patients would enjoy and, and that we would enjoy being clinicians as a part of. Thank you, Dr. Driver. Dr. Dua, word or phrase? Yes, I would say that the word is metamorphosis right now because, you know, there are a few things that have happened even within our lifetimes that have absolutely just hit the ball and moved it completely out of the line in which it, the trajectory in which it was going. Um, iPhones, the internet, when I'm talking digital things, you know, and we are waiting for our next big thing. And I think this is it. The ability to actually change from the way in which we are doing and delivering healthcare to a completely new system that revolutionaries really have to sit down and think about in order to implement. Um, because the way that we are currently doing things aren't working. We, we know that. That's why we're here talking about how it's not working. We've cobbled together something that's historic and we're kind of chugging it along, but there are many bodies quite literally <laughs> littering both sides that we've been unable to save because we've not been using new tools. And just like, you know, penicillin came about, changed the way things are. Again, computers and digital force. Now, I think we need to harness the way in which we're, we're doing things and actually bring about a complete metamorphosis um, 
way in which we approach healthcare. And so I'm ready for it. And I think my colleagues are ready for it. And the patients are absolutely ready for it. So it's just time for doing. Executives uh, uh, have a lot to think about and a lot of examples to draw from this. So thank you to Dr. Driver, Dr. Jackson, and Dr. Dua for your leadership and perspectives. Uh, and I'm excited about our collective journey towards uh, addressing equitable health for everyone. Uh, and with that, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Dina, from Salesforce. Oh, thank you all so much. I, I got to tell you, um, we've all been in healthcare for a very long time. And today was a very different kind of conversation. And that encourages me, right? So five years ago, we were not talking about kindness. We were not talking about the personalized experience. We weren't talking about health spans. And so this is encouraging that we're witnessing the evolution and the metamorphosis that, that you're talking about. And Salesforce is delighted to be part of this journey with each of you. And we, with our entire heart, we thank you for your collaboration and your partnership. And until next time, be well, everyone. That is all the time we have for today. I want to thank Dr. Jackson, Dr. Driver, Dr. Dua, Dr. Bott, and Dina for an excellent discussion today, and also to Salesforce for sponsoring today's webinar. Thank you again for joining us today, and we hope to see you at future Becker's webinars.